Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. And have, have had a good time so far. And, you know, for the most part, I'm a, I'm a free woman today. Um, I can, you know, um, I'm not someone, if you would have told me that I could, you know, get on a plane, which is something I was always terrified of, and make small talk and all of that, you know, I, 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 um, I, I, I have a good life. And, it, and it, most of the time, I'm, I'm pretty free. And that's, that's fantastic. I, I, a lot of things that were said this weekend have just got, have gotten me, you know, thinking about, about things I hadn't thought about in a while. And Tim was telling that story about when he had that car accident and, um, you know, just the way that we're, we're everywhere and, or just the, the improbability that, you know, we absolutely are people that normally should not mix. And I made me think of a story in my home group, um, right the, the day after a nine 11. So that was a Wednesday. My home group meets on a Wednesday night and we have a tradition in my home group called a watch. And when someone is um, turning a year sober, Everyone, we sit up with them in a coffee shop until midnight, and you watch them uh, turn sober. And and it was somebody's, uh, yeah, it's usually, you know, two, three hundred people there. It's a very nice, very nice tradition. I, a couple, year and a half ago, I got to sit at my nephew's watch, which was pretty awesome. And, um, you know, Tim was talking about that, about, boy, you know, I love AA, and I, but when when you start seeing it work in, in the life of a family member, it's a whole other, whole other level there of appreciation. And. But anyway, so uh, there was a, a couple guys between the meeting and the watch. There's some some time to kill, and so a couple guys in my home group, Freeway Ray, um, who continues to live under the under the freeways. He's a homeless guy that is in and out or what have you, and, and he's with this guy Glenn. Is going to give him a ride. And, you know, Glenn is now sober, but of course, you know, we have we have our stories that we come come in here with, and he um he graduated from UCLA actually later in sobriety but prior to that he lived in some dumpsters at UCLA and he would get cold and he would start fires and so he had some arson charges and <laughs> and you know all of this makes sense here of course right <laughs> and and there was another guy in our group Shakar that at that time owned a bunch of like pay phones and ATMs and so he had this white panel van and uh, we have a lot of Persians um, in 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 our home group in, in the Los Angeles area. And uh, and so Glenn is working for Shakar, and he and Freeway Way are looking to kill some time before the watch. And they decide, well, let's drive by the federal building and see if there's anything going on. It's the day after 9-11. Well, there's a lot going on. Um, <laughs> and by the way, my home group meets in a synagogue. And um, so... They, they're in Shakar's white panel van, you know, um, <laughs> and they're driving past, and this, for some reason there's a video camera in the van. They just started, decide to start filming, so Glenn, the arsonist, and Freeway Way get pulled over. Or, you know, for, well, first they ran the plates, and of course it's registered to Shakar, Muhammad, Mamandi, you know, um, and you know, not... Th- Oh, this only makes sense here, right? It did not make sense to the FBI at all. And uh, so they pulled them over, and of course, Ray has no known address, and you know, and, and Glenn has an address, but he's got these old arson charges. And then they said, well, where are you coming from? Well, we've been at the university synagogue, and it just, it just got worse and worse. <laughs> you, you can't explain any of that, right? It, except here, again, it's just not... And anyway, they ended up in separate rooms in the basement of the federal building until six in the morning and missed the watch. But um, all's well that ends well, I guess. And we absolutely are people that people that wouldn't mix. And um, my life is good. My sobriety date is September twenty fourth, nineteen eighty five. I don't have any bad news about my life in Alcoholics Anonymous. And you know, that being said, that doesn't mean that I you know, came here and worked the 12 Golden Steps and never had another bad day. I mean, I, you know, the forces that brought me here are still very much with me, and I have to treat my alcoholism and, and treat it aggressively. And um, But I have been able to live life on life's terms, which is a pretty good deal for somebody like me. I, there's lots of alcoholism in my family on, on both sides, and my uh, my great-grandfather on my dad's side, I know that he spent the last years of his life in a state mental institution, um, 
up in, in Northern California, and I, I assume that he was a wet brain from the photos. It looks like that, and that he'd been committed there, and, and that's where he left, you know, um, spent the rest of his days. His son, though, my grandfather, got and stayed sober sometime in the 1940s, and I know that because I have this big book. It's the first edition, 11th printing. There's no traditions in there because it hasn't been written yet, and it says Don McRae, Eureka, California, inside there, and and uh, I mentioned that he died when I was 14, when I was just starting to drink. Um, but he was my first example. And I didn't know when I was looking at him that I was looking at Alcoholics Anonymous, but I knew there was something special about him for sure. Mm-hmm. And um, I knew that he did, that he used to drink, and that he used to be like my dad, and he wasn't like that anymore. And um, my father, who has never found his way here, his son, you know, was never able to really be much of a provider. He left my mom, uh, the librarian, with um, my comrade back there, Chris, um, he, with these four children uh, to raise. And he didn't go far. He moved in down the street with another woman and her kids. And that's never funny in an Al-Anon meeting. Though, you know? <laughs> I'm here to report Larsine did not, did not laugh. Um, and... <laughs> but it was my grandfather, you know, who I imagined he was making living amends. He had not been able to be much of a, a father for my dad because he was doing his thing. And But it was my grandfather who, um, you know, put, when my dad left, he helped my mother make the house payment. She took in boarders and did some other things to make ends meet. But he, he paid the tuition at the Catholic school that I went to, and he put braces on my teeth. And he, you know, and, and he... You were working in my life before I ever even knew that I needed you. My childhood would have been very different had he not wandered into Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, 400 miles away um, in the 1940s. And and your fingerprints are are all over my life. And I'm very grateful I was able to, after I got sober, and his third wife, I mean, he was an alcoholic, um, she just just died a couple weeks ago, 105. And... um, she had, his office had been exactly the same, and after I got sober, and, and I went and visited her when I had a couple of years, and I remembered that book, because it had that, what they call the circus cover, the red and yellow cover with that red dot on the spine, and seeing that, it, I, it just caught my eye, because it was colorful, I guess, and, and asked her, um, you know, do you still have Grandpa's book, and, and then there it was, it was still there, and very grateful for that, and very grateful for the message that was in that book that, that you know, changed my, changed my life, and um, on my mom's side, you know, um, um, uh, we grew up in, in Santa Cruz in Northern California. I, I was home, I guess, uh, maybe maybe it was Christmas or all my family's still in that area. And there was an article in, in the local paper about the first person in our family that had come to that area, you know, come from Ireland. And um, it was about he had opened the first um, bar in, in, the, in the county. Mm-hmm. And... He became something I didn't know until I read in this article that at 85, he was the oldest man up until that time to be jailed in the state of California because <laughs> because the county had gone dry and he refused to stop selling. And so they kept putting him in jail and they, the, 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 the Sisters of Charity would bring him his meals and, and, uh, and they'd let him out and he'd go right then. The, the article said, but every time he returned to the bar, I, I, I understand that, Uncle Patrick. I, I, I really do. Um, as I mentioned, I went to a Catholic school, and I certainly don't want to offend anybody here, but I love Catholic school, and I don't think I'm recovering from that experience, and, you know, and I recognize that may not have been your experience, but mine was a very positive one. I'm very grateful um, for the education that I received there. I'm grateful the priests and the nuns in my parish were very good examples of love and service, and they seem to be living their lives with meaning and purpose, and I had a good connection with the God of my faith. I'm not someone who I'm described as the wanderer from faith, the bewildered one. I had a faith that worked for me at one time. But when I began, you know, to, to, to drink, of course, I had to. The thing that was the most precious to me, which was that connection with that faith at that time, was the thing that I had to that I had to walk away from. And alcoholism, it seems, demands that from us. Whatever line we're not going to cross, whatever principle we're not going to break, you know. And um, I, <clears throat> growing up in this, you know, this kind of chaotic home, um, you know, I mean, I used to think I had this really tragic childhood, and since becoming a teacher in Los Angeles, my perceptions have altered considerably. But, um, you know, it, it was I was that kid that, you know, digging through the hamper to put on a kind of semi-clean uniform to put on to get to, you know, school late. And we always had, 
these different station wagons with coat hanger antennas. Anybody else have the have the coat hanger antenna? And our Christmas lights were up all year. You know, the garbage can stayed out all week, and lots of broken windows at our house. Sometimes the power would be cut off, or the phone would be cut off. You just kind of never knew what you were going to get. Was it going to be a good time? Was it going to be a bad time? You know, was my dad going to be bloody and beat up, or was you know were his trucker friends going to leave a crate of roosters on the porch so that when the sun came up, you know, they'd, they'd wake them up. Ha, ha, ha. Um, <laughs> you never kind of knew. You know, to this day, all of my siblings, right, we have that exaggerated startle response that maybe maybe that's where it had its roots, you know. I, um, I don't know, but... Um, at the same time, though, there was a lot of love in that house, and, and there still is a lot of a, a lot of love in that family. We're very lucky. There's now been a lot of a recovery. We're into our second generation. I have two nephews that are um, that are sober, and a niece who's in Al-Anon. And, and boy, what a what a gift that is. Tim and I were talking about that at dinner. And, but um, when I graduated, unfortunately, the the high school had closed, and my mom had gone to that high school. My grandmother had gone to that high school, and that was important to my mom. And, I was the youngest of her four kids, and the, the high school closed, so it only went up to the eighth grade. But the morning after my eighth grade graduation, my mom came out to the kitchen table, and she had my diploma, and I'd won some little pins and stuff. I'd been pretty active there in that school and in that, in that parish. And, and she said to me, Ken, I finally got my scholar. And, you know, she was pleased. And I can tell you that maybe a year, a year and a half later, I was in front of my mom again, and my life was, you know, my life was different. I was now behind the counter at the Wiener Schnitzel. Uh, I was working there full time selling chili cheese dogs and and I had uh dropped out of high school with a zero point eight GPA and my mom was there because I hadn't been home the night before and she was standing there and trying not to cry and saying, You know, I don't understand what has happened to you, you used to be so active and she meant in our parish and, and she had that look of heartbreak and bafflement on her face, um, that we all know so well. And, uh, you know, and I, I can't stand to see that look on your face because I know I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. I mean, it, it, yes, this is painful, but for what I get from alcohol, I'm willing to pay that price apparently. And, you know, saying to her, get out of here, leave me alone, you don't care, just anything to make her kind of go away. And um, sometime before that, I had taken, I think, I guess in that year, I think it was maybe my, maybe it was my sophomore year um, I had taken my first geographic. It seemed like my friends could party on the weekends and end up back in school, and I wasn't able to do that. It seemed to give me a little bit more trouble, but I, I didn't actually think it was my drinking. I thought, well, maybe if I can just, I'll go somewhere where I don't know anyone, and then I won't be so tempted, and I'll go to school. And I had an older sister, not much older. Um, she was 19 at the time. Um, she's six years older than me and sober today, but drinking at that time, and she was um, living over in Honolulu. She had had um, one of my nephews was a single mom, was raising him, collecting welfare and drinking. And so that became my plan. So I thought, well, I'll go live with her and, you know, I'll enroll in high school and, and it'll all be different. Of course, as you know, wherever you go, there you are. And it um, seemed like the same people that were at Santa Cruz High were at Kaiser High in Honolulu, and I'm, and I'm off and running. And things didn't get any better there. In fact, they got worse. And we ended up losing our apartment, and we were homeless for a while, and we never slept on the streets or anything, but we stayed different people's couches, and I certainly remember that, you know, nobody was ever happy to see us coming, right? These two teenage girls and a baby and some food stamps. We did always seem to manage to, you know, to have alcohol, and, and now, of course, you know, I went to school every day for maybe like the first week, and then and then that that became a distant memory, and I can remember the Easter Sunday of that year, getting off a city bus. And I, I was by myself and going to stay with someone, I don't remember who, but stepping off that bus, I had all my belongings in a pillowcase and just my eye catching that pillowcase and thinking, you know, something's wrong with my life here. It's Easter Sunday. I should have been at Mass. I should be with my family. What, you know, what's going on? But I was really just kind of getting started. And to make matters worse, I got drunk and pregnant in that order, which was to become a common order for me. And, um, and I remember being on the beach at Waikiki, hungover, morning sick. I had to keep going out into the water to vomit, and every time I'd come back, and I, you know, you just get so tired. I just wanted to pass out, and my sister kept trying to talk me into entering one of the bikini contests in the in the bars on the beach there because we really needed the 50 bucks. And man, I'm glad I have different choices <laughs> today. It was not, <laughs> not a happy memory. Um, 
anyway, I realized that, you know what, obviously, I know what the problem is. It's, uh, it's Honolulu. And California is going to be the answer. And I, you know, and I terminated that pregnancy, and I'm not here to moralize about that for anybody but me. But it had been just a year or so before that that I'd been confirmed in the Catholic Church, and that faith that mattered to me. And that was that line I wasn't going to cross, and that principle I wasn't going to break. And, and now I've got a secret, and I'm a bad girl. And my drinking's a little different, and it's done a little bit more for me. Because it's, you know, that, that it's, it's taking away that, that shame and remorse, only temporarily, of course. And, and uh, I got back to California. I'll just forget Hawaii ever happened. That's what I'm going to do. And, then, you know, I'll get back there. And that's when my restaurant career started there, the Wiener Stencil. And, and, you know, I didn't know when I took that job that I was going to work in restaurants for the next 17 years. And the first 11 years of my sobriety, there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that kind of work, except that I was never happy doing it. It was, you know, going to be one of those temporary things in how my real life started. And I'll tell you, I'm grateful to you for many, many, many things. But up towards the top of that list, I'm grateful for old-timers and mentors um, who were more interested in my long-term recovery than in how I felt about something in the moment, who are willing to do the hard thing, who are willing, uh, you know, to ask me to, you know, to remind me that our common welfare comes first, for example, or to be willing to be uncomfortable for a moment so I could get to that long-term freedom on the other side. You know, I'm grateful that you expected things from me. Um, because if you don't expect things from me, I won't, I won't do anything. You know, I really won't. And, um, and the way that I was, you know, living at, at that time, it was just all, it, you know, there was no, I, I just, you know, it was just kind of willy-nilly, you know, um, and, so I'm working there, and um, I, I met a gentleman, and, and I was thinking not long ago and he, that our first date was a double date. Both of those guys are dead, and the other girl, uh, who was my best friend for many years, when I got sober in 1985, she was living in a pickup truck with her boyfriend at the time and in our hometown and using the university to shower, and, some, and, and she's been in and out as long as I've, I've been here. And I am, you know, clearly very, very grateful for 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 the journey that that I have that I have been able to take. And um, but this this guy that you know it seemed like a perfect match. I mean, he didn't say things like, "Has you have you been drinking? It's only 9 a.m." or "My mom says you can't come over anymore." or "What are those slash marks on your wrist?" You know, he didn't say any of that. He woke up with the shakes like I did, and and it and it was it was great. And until it wasn't, of course, and and. I ended up um, losing the Joe Schnitzel job, which is possible to do. I, um, <laughs> I, I think, honestly, I think I, I maybe quit just before I was fired. But I, um, the final thing was that I'd been, been drinking on the beach all day. You know how that drinking in the sun sometimes puts a different edge on things? And, <laughs> and I decided to go up to the old Wiener Schnitzel and uh, lay in wait for someone who was getting off work. That Something about a stolen bicycle, I don't know, but... Um, you know, I, I, I leapt on her, and I'm drunk, and she's in uniform, so that's, you know, brings dishonor to the brand, I guess, and <laughs> we're rolling around in the parking lot, and I'm so drunk, and, you know, she got she got the better of me, and then I ran behind the counter um, and, and made a scene back there, and I don't know, is, where is, it, is it in the doctor's opinion, where is it about the, an alcoholic in his cups is an unlovely creature, <laughs> and... It, that certainly was. But anyway, I recovered from that and showed them, and I went across town to the Great American Wiener Works, and I, I got a job. I got a job over there because I had my hot dog experience. And, um, and I stole from that place. That was a little mom-and-pop place, a married couple trying to make their living selling hot dogs. I appreciate that. Now, at the time, what I saw was free beer. And I'm, you know, stealing cases of beer from them. And that was an amends that I did not make, the financial amends that I didn't make. Um, I had moved away, got sober, and I went back. The business was gone. They had moved on. I, all I knew were their first names. But I went to a neighboring business, and they said, well, this might be their phone number. They moved away. And I I didn't act on it. I procrastinated, and I lost that thread. Only to be haunted by it for the next 20-some years. And I was... Um, I was giving a talk in the San Fernando Valley, and I don't know, of course, you know, Tim, I, I didn't want to go. Um, I never want to go until I actually get here. And I don't know why I said it that night, but I said I've never made that amends, and I said what I knew. And this is, you know, 400 miles from 
uh, where that was, and the, the, their names were Chuck and Edie, Great American Wiener Works in Santa Cruz in 1978. And someone came up to me and got my email, and I had an email the next day that said, I'm a private investigator, and part of my amends is to helping other people make theirs, and I found the people that you're looking for. And I was able to uh, make that phone call and write that check and make that right. So don't quit 30 years before the miracle happens, I guess. Is the, <laughs> is the moral of that story. Or just, just make the amends when, you, when the first opportunity comes along. But truly, God does not make too hard of terms with, you know, with those who seek him. And, and I'm glad that I've been taught to do my job in AA. And I was doing my job in AA that night. And that guy was doing his job in AA that night. And God could come in in that place in the middle. Um, anyway, I, 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 I bought a car around this time, and, you know, I've gotten some big things in sobriety. I've, I've gone to school here, and I recently bought a home, which in California is no easy feat. And, and uh, I, um, but I tell you, it's still the little things. You know, my car is parked back at LAX, and, but I want you to know I have a license to drive it with my current address in my wallet. Um, I have an insurance card that protects me and you. I have tags on my plates. And I bought those tags of money that I earned. I didn't take a shredded razor blade and scrape those tags off anybody else's plates. You know, those are my tags. And, and that's not the way that I was living when I got to you. I thought that freedom was in getting on an airplane, black eye, sunglasses, one-way ticket, hungover. I used to have long hair. I was a hair of one of those hair flippers from way back. And, um, you know, I thought that's what freedom was. And when I got to you and the things that you asked me to do, like be where I say I'm going to be, where I say I'm going to, when I say I'm going to be there and, you know, take a commitment and keep it, that's not freedom. That's stricture. That's the opposite of it. Um, it, or so it seemed to me. But I found, you know, that, um, in the satisfactions of right living about service gladly rendered and obligations squarely met, that these are the satisfactions of right living. And, and that's what freedom has come to look like for me. And I had no idea, you know, this whole process for me, in, in the time that I've been here, have been these little incremental surrenders and these, you know, these moments, the postcards that were, that um, I think uh, Chris talked about, where you just get to see things a little bit differently and a little bit differently and a little bit differently. And sometimes you see, like, oh, I've been so wrong all this time. Um, but uh, so I, you know, I have this car and this boyfriend, and I'm working at the Wiener Works. And, you know, that car became like this metaphor for my life, you know, no surprise. Um, the things started to happen to it, and, and I, um, the, and of course, no driver's license, no registration, no insurance. In fact, I didn't even know how to drive. It was always, you know, ready, fire, aim. I bought the car first, and then I eventually learned how to drive. And I think the first thing that happened, there was an electrical fire over here, and there was big chunks of the carpet would come up, and then the, the window on this side, but somehow I lost the handle for that, and I'd keep matches in there, but then you need the matches, and and the window would clunk down. I remember so clearly the day that the window clunked down and shattered, and I just thought, oh, thank God. I don't have to, just like, you know, I don't have to share my matches with the window. You're just willing to, to make those, those concessions. And, um, I flew off a curb one night and, and broke the tie rod, which, oh, I don't, it never mattered though. It didn't. I just continued to drive it. I don't, it was supposed to matter, but it, it, something broke. That was it. Of course, it was not getting fixed. And, and the brake lights went out, and I remember my brother saying, you know, that's dangerous. And, well, eventually so did the brake. So what difference does it make? And I had this whole, this whole routine. I don't remember exactly the order, but it was something like, you know, downshifting and pumping the brakes and using the emergency brake and putting my foot out the door. This whole routine that would happen. And, you know, it's no wonder that we are just so tired when we get here. You know, I mean, that is some, that is some hard living. It, it really is. And um, things are starting to happen there in my hometown. People are starting to die around me a little bit. Blackouts aren't so cute anymore. I'm starting to hide my drinking a little bit more. Um, this relationship with this guy is getting frightening. I can't tell anyone what's happening with that. And, and, um, and I just, I kind of fast forward. I, 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 I don't know if, you know, I'm sure many of you have had that feeling, maybe in your hometowns or just, it all starts to close in and you think it's, you know, it's time to go. It's, it's time to go. And I had a particularly bad week. I'd been beaten up pretty badly by this guy. And I was certainly a, a part of that, you know, that drunken violence as well. I was, you know, no, no victim there. Um, and I came to one morning, and I had that weight on my chest, and, and that was not a good feeling. I thought it had something to do with my car, but I wasn't sure. My car was in my mom's garage, and that was a bad sign because I, I never put it there. And 
there were pieces missing off that car, which I've yet to find. And I, you know, called my friends because now I can't tell you that I really don't know what I was doing last night. And I'm trying to, you know, hope that you'll drop some clues to let me know. And there were a few, another trip to the liquor store that I didn't remember. And, but I don't know. And I, I, I picked up the morning paper. I remember opening that paper, you know, that I had the shakes to see if I had, had I hit anyone or killed anyone. And to this day, I don't know what happened, but, um, I do know I left that car in my house garage. Um, I shut the door on it. I did not tell that guy where I was going. I bought a one-way ticket, black guy, sunglasses, hungover. And I went back to Honolulu because now California's the problem, and that's going to be the answer. And, and I had just turned 18. Um, I got a job in a bar, drinking ages 18 at that time in the state of Hawaii, and started making good money for an 18-year-old high school dropout. It seemed very glamorous and exciting. We had four bands a day and two Elvis impersonators and dollar fifty cocktails and Six years later, when I was still working there, the, the bloom had come off that rose. But um, <laughs> at the time, it seemed really exciting. And, you know, I'm drinking in bars now. And, and um, but I'll tell you, I'm just crossing those lines. I, um, I started dating a, ma- a married man, one of the Elvis's bass players. And, and, um, <laughs> and that was certainly, you know, problematic for, uh, for my job and his job and his family life. And, and I have now abandoned any kind of claims on integrity or dignity, and so I certainly aren't expecting it from you. And, um, you know, I'm just kind of circling the drain. And by the time I was 19, I was on my fourth abortion. And how would that happen? I mean, and I, you know, I had never planned on living that way. I assure you, I was never going to live that way. And now I don't see any way that I can redeem what my life has become because you can't fix that. There's no making that right. You know, there's a good Catholic word, perdition. Spiritual ruin, loss of a soul. I didn't, couldn't have put that name on it. We often hear to call it spiritual moral bankruptcy, but that's, you know, where I spent and where we spend the last few years of my drinking that I, you know, I, I just thought that I was, um, in a place beyond any kind of redemption. And so what do you do? You drink, you know? Um, and, uh, the last few years of my drinking, there was a brief, there was a couple little respites I could kind of get it together. I haven't thought about this in a long time, but I, at one point, I think my married boyfriend wasn't leaving his wife the way I thought he should, and I, I went to China for six weeks. Um, <laughs> and I don't recommend going to a communist country for a practicing alcoholic. It was really hard to, to drink over there. I went by myself. Well, you had to be with the tour group. And anyway, he was still married when I got back. It didn't. It didn't much help. But um, I, I remember how uncomfortable I was there, and I couldn't figure it out at the time. And I. I, I certainly know now, but um, the last few years of my drinking, I spent um, drinking in the strip bars in Honolulu. I could not go in, in the, the nightclubs in Waikiki anymore. Um, I worked in Waikiki, and we would all, you know, kind of go to each other's bars and stuff. But but the last year or two, I, I can't do that. Um, the problem with that is, is that, you know, you might want me to do something like dance or have a conversation and I'm not there for those reasons. Well, one, I can't fit my behavior anymore. I have a huge capacity for alcohol, but towards the end there, you know, I might just have two or three drinks, and my, my body is getting drunk very quickly, and doormen are putting me in taxi cabs and sending me away. My mind is staying sober well into 10, 20, 30 drinks. I can't shut the head off, but my, my body's getting drunk, and, and, or, you know, or I might just have a crying jag, and it might, you know, you just, yeah, I just, I don't know what's going to happen. Or, or I might start slurring, you know, I'm slurring my words very, very quickly. Like I, I developed a stutter and just came back to me for a minute. Um, and I, I, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. And so it's just easier to, I could go to those strip bars. They were open until 4 a.m. They're the kind they always advertise in the sports section. We're often under new management. And so rather, rather low expectations there. And, you know, I could look at the women that were doing what they were doing, making a living. And I think, well, at least I'm not doing that. No one, you know, no one was interested in the conversation. And, and I could just kind of drink and be left alone. And, and, um, and you know, that's, that's uh, where we end up in places like that. I didn't have to worry about anybody looking, looking askance. And, and also they, they're open till 4 a.m. and they reopen at 6 a.m. And I took comfort in that because, you know, you have to figure all that out. Because the liquor store stops selling at midnight. And I can't be without, you know, what if 4 a.m. comes and I'm not, you know, where I need to be. And oh, I developed a little routine. I'd run downstairs. There's a, there was a liquor store under the bar that I worked at. And um, and just before midnight, I'd go down there. I'd get a couple little airplane bottles of vodka, 
to keep with me just in case, you know, between four and six and that little range in there and not social drinking, I guess. And my, uh, <laughs> my married boyfriend was starting to not want to come over because the way that I lived and, you know, and I just thought he was paranoid and always on me about something. And but obviously we, you know, couldn't go to his house and, and, um, <laughs> he, you know, I ended up, um, I was not living on the sands of Kailua Beach, I want you to know. I was living in a cinder block building between the Honolulu City bus yard and the Kenau Street freeway, freeway off-ramp. And um, I ended up living in an apartment that was very much like the house I grew up in, and I was never going to live that way. It was going to be different for me, you know. I I, I wasn't going to, I, I you know, and I, I don't know if I attributed the condition of our house and stuff to alcoholism as a kid, but I just knew I wasn't having any of that. You know, I remember... My dad, before he left one weekend, he was going to paint the house, and he got it about halfway sanded, and then it just stayed that way until we moved, you know, which which I, I understand that today. But in it, at the apartment I was living, if, if something went wrong, it just it just stayed that way. And um, my boyfriend came over this one afternoon, and I um, had was drunk, still kind of half drunk from the day before, and had stitches on my ankle, which is for another evening, and that I know you understand. And it was it was about three in the afternoon, which is like my mornings, and and I had um, hurt myself at work. And I by the time I got to the hospital, I was so drunk, and they could see that I could self medicate. And actually, the ankle, the vein down there had been cut open, so it was pretty painful. They had some stitches in there, but they didn't give me anything for the pain. The next day, I'm kind of stumbling around. You know, my my boyfriend came over and said, you know, look at your ankle, and and I looked down; it was covered with fleas, and I um, often tell that story when I talk, and, um, you know, just in case I ever think there's any glamour left in a cocktail for me or, you know, that I don't want to um, come out to Richmond, Virginia, or uh, Williamsburg, Virginia, to share my experience on a Saturday night. or any, And, then, you know, this is the great stuff. This is the easy stuff. But any of the other stuff I'm asked to do around here, I want to keep that image really fresh in my mind because that's the life that I brought to you. And it's clearly, you know, it's clearly not the one that I have today. And that, um, as I said, that apartment that I ended up living in, the first phone call I made to you was from a payphone in the liquor store because my phone had been cut off. And I easily made my rent and a couple nights and tips. But, you know, I just, I love that in the doctor's opinion where it says the alcoholic's problems pile up on him and become astonishingly difficult to solve. I just, I, this, you know, the things that seem so simple, it's, I love what uh, Bob Bazan says that we can we can do the the extraordinary, but we can't do the ordinary. And boy, isn't that true? Oh, man, I mean, the, just what we've heard this week and the things that we can survive. You know, penitentiary, alcohol poisoning, uh, car wrecks. Oh, you know, all all manner of things. But you know, file my taxes, call a plumber. You know, just anything. Uh, that was all too much, and I. When I got sober, I was renting out my bedroom in that apartment and passing out on the living room floor. I mean, why not? And there were some louvered windows in that apartment, and the bottom five or six were broken, and there were feral cats that lived in that city bus yard. I think that's where the fleas came from. And they'd, they'd come through those broken windows and eat out of the trash and spray all over, and there was a big wet spot in the carpet. Now I would I would call a plumber. I might have to call someone and say, hey, I'm going to call the plumber and call you back and tell you I did it. I don't know why I'm still, like, why that stuff is still tricky for me, um, but but I, at least I could do it. And uh, but that, and so that wet spot in the carpet just got bigger, and I just got better at leaping over it and passing, you know, <laughs> getting the cats out and passing out on that floor and coming to in the morning with that racing brain, you know, and vomiting liver bile and trying to keep some drops of water on my tongue. And my head would say the same thing like a thousand times a day: Normal people don't do this. Normal people don't do this. It would just race like that. And I would try to, you know, get it together enough to get in a taxi cab with a hat pulled down over my eyes to get to the bar that I worked at. And, and my life got small, really. So I had stopped driving after I left California that last time. And and um, and what I can see now is it just became this life that had been shrunken down to its smallest dimensions, just narrowly circumscribed by alcoholism. You know, the, the apartment I lived in, the couple of bars I drank at, and the bar that I worked at. And it just got smaller and smaller and smaller. And... um I was 22 when I got to you. I was um, 84 pounds. My hair was falling out. My gums were 
were seen for malnutrition and all that stuff that happens to us in end-stage alcoholism is, was happening to me. But I, you know, I didn't, I was in that jumping off place. Is the alcohol taking me from, to crazy or keeping me from going there? I can't live with it and I can't live without it, you know. And I, um, I, um, you know, would hear my voice called from a long way off, feel stuff crawling on my skin, or I, I uh, would wake up in the night and be convinced there'd be somebody under my bed or out of my lanai, just that, you know, just that terror of, of alcoholism. And, and that is a that is a frightening place. When it's the thing that has worked best for you and it turns on you, that is such a frightening, frightening place to be. And and that day came for me in, in 1985 and just nothing was working. And, and I guess the difference between that day and others is that I, well, it was kind of a new level of desperation. And, and my, my friend Vince Yo, may rest in peace, used to, he used to talk about that gift of desperation, and I wish that for you and his memory if you're new, and because that's certainly what what drove me down to the payphone at the liquor store, and my phone was cut off. The first call that I made for help was from a payphone at a liquor store, and um, and I couldn't go in that liquor store anymore. I'd been drunk and profane in there. Of course, the concept of like you know making that right would never occur to me. I just found another liquor store, which meant that I had to run across that freeway off-ramp and scramble up the embankment, cut through a hole in a chain link fence, and get to the next closest liquor store. It never occurred to me there's anything unusual about that. You know, that's where the liquor store is, and I know I know you understand. And, um, but this particular day, I started to pray. I had a bottle of vodka that I was kept in the freezer. I'd try to keep that down, you know, b- between the vomiting and the liver bile, and I had a rosary in one hand, and and the vodka over here, and I, I imagine that the events of that day, you know, I certainly attribute that to to the praying that I did, and I found myself down at that payphone at the liquor store. I really had nobody to call. I certainly couldn't call my boyfriend. He was home with his wife, and and I called my boss um, at the um, at, at the bar, and he was a drinking buddy, and his wife was an alcoholic, and had fallen drunk recently off of Lanai and had broken her neck, and then had gone into DTs when she was in the hospital, so the big alcoholism word had come up, and so I called him, and, and he came and got me, and he take a, took a look at me, and I was sick and shaking, and he said, you know, you need a drink, let's let's go get a drink, and he was right, I really did, And but I said to him, no, take me to the hospital, I don't know why I said it, but that's what I said, and that's what he did, he took me to an emergency room, and I saw a nurse first, and I said to her, you know, I can probably stop the cocaine, but I can't stop drinking. I can't stop drinking. And I didn't know about the first step, and I didn't know that I was making an admission of complete defeat. That's all in hindsight. But I do remember that there was some kind of a little tiny shift. Just just something moved when I said that. And then the nurse said, well, my boyfriend's an alcoholic, and he goes to AA. And I remember immediately thinking, oh, well, it's, you know, easy there. And then, that's, that's a little extreme, don't you think? And, so, but, um, and then I saw a doctor who, at the time, I thought was terribly unkind. I wanted sympathy and Valium and not in that order. <laughs> and, you know, I am really glad that he did not pretend to have an answer. You know, what I know now is that you have my answers. You have my answers. And my sponsor, Mary, and my former sponsor, she's recently passed away, but you, she she would say that, and she said it with such conviction. I would think, God, how, how amazing to live your life like that. I mean, she really just and and I can now say that with such conviction. You really do have my answers. And and um, that doctor said to me, um, I can't help you. You're an alcoholic, and here's some phone numbers. And this was 1985, so treatment centers on every every corner, lots of them. And I and I have insurance, and I, I it's all a bit of a blur. But and I think that those numbers were to treatment centers. Um, but I remember the next day or sometime within that time period going down to the payphone at the liquor store and making some calls. And I remember a voice on one, on one of those calls and a woman saying, we don't have a bed, but you go to this place tonight. And I don't even know, it turned out to be the, the Salvation Army detox up on the Poly Highway. And, and I, I'm not even sure if I knew I was going to an AA meeting. I just knew I needed to go to that place tonight because I was scared to drink and I was scared not to drink. And, you know, and kind of the gig was up. And so I got my uh, somebody to, to give me a ride up there. And, you know, I did not come here and feel like I was home at all. I would see you guys laughing and talking and smiling. I was so afraid. And I would just think, I'm never going to feel that way. I will never have that light in my eyes. I'm never going to laugh like that. I'll never be comfortable in my skin like that. I know that I won't. 
but I still, as cynical and as broken as I was when I got here, I believed you. Whatever it was that I saw, I knew that it was real, and I knew that you were sincere, and I believed you. I knew that you had what I had, and so I kept coming, and I was very lucky that I kind of got, fell into a group of, you know, very a, active AAs, and and um, I got a home group because the people around me got a home group. We met on Tuesday nights, and they, the um, uh, Steps to Freedom group, and, and they still meet, as far as I know, on Tuesday nights in Honolulu, and, and it was a step study, and I got a sponsor because everybody around me um, got a sponsor, and I began to, but it was so, oh, man, initially, you know, I would just get there, like, at 759 and as soon as it was a coffee break, I would hide in the bathroom. And as soon as he said amen, I was just I was just out of there. And I would, you know, I would, when um, Chris was talking about, you know, having to read, I just, I, when my turn would come, and I just knew you could all see my heart just pounding out of my chest, that extreme self-obsession, you know. And um, But I, I started to get a little bit more comfortable around you, and, and I, um, you know, I did not, certainly didn't have any, uh, any trouble with, with, with the first step. I, I, you know, never had any reservations. Um, once I had said that I, I couldn't stop drinking, I, you know, I, I knew that I was an alcoholic and I certainly was, was powerless. And, and I also, you know, um, as far as I was from God in those early days, it was clear that I was living in a, in a state of grace because I wasn't drinking. You know, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I was not drinking. And, and, you know, and here I'm the person who thought I could never, you know, that, that I can never return to any kind of a God or that that's not going to be possible for me. But yet this remarkable thing had happened. The obsession to drink was lifted for me in that emergency room. And and it's never come back. And, and um, you know, I, I was being restored to, to certainly that type of sanity. That obsession was gone. And, and I love that my, my friend Clint, um, may he rest in peace, he used to say this about, in Bill's story, I you know that he talks about how God that God comes to most men slowly, but his impact on Bill was sudden and profound. And and I used to you know wish for that boy if, if my room would have lit up with a great white light, I'd somehow be more sober or have less character defects. Or <laughs> but you know I have to keep in mind that one day in 1985, September 23rd, 1985, I could not not drink. And on September 24th, 1985. I did not pick up a drink, and absolutely God's impact on me was sudden and profound. Not possible. It's not possible for any of us, and yet here we sit. You know, and the view from here, by the way, is, is fantastic. And um, I, uh, you know, I had some trepidation about um, the, the third step with, with, with my sponsor, um, and I remember, and she just wasn't having any of that. I remember um, <laughs> saying, something about my program and she said you know Kenneth someone who's only worked the first two and a half steps really doesn't doesn't have a program and <laughs> that was a little unkind but you know I have a Catholic education I know what it means to turn my will and my life over to, 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 I know what that third step prayer means it means a vocation I'm gonna you know I'll join Mother Teresa's order and be cleaning the wounds of lepers and um, I've since learned that God reserves those jobs for the more spiritually fit, and, and that would and that would not be me. And I guess you know my point there is there were so many things that I thought A was going to somehow take for me. I had it all wrong, you know. I had it all wrong, and everything that I thought maybe that you wanted from me, you've actually given to me. And and that inventory was so was so frightening that initial inventory. But I knew intuitively. I didn't know much, but I did know that I was going to have to find a way to live comfortably in my skin or I would drink again. That I knew. And you seem to get that comfort through the process of the steps, in particular through a searching inventory and sharing that with someone. And, and I, and I, you know, I finally did that. And I, you know, I didn't get what I wanted. I wanted Ben-Hur music and the sky to open up and I'll never have another negative human emotion. And, and But I got... You know, I felt like you could look me in the eye and I didn't have to be afraid of what you were going to see. And I felt like I was starting to become a member in good standing of Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, there's, I think I mentioned my friend from Hawaii, dear al that I love. And she, uh, I heard her say once that every alcoholic woman has this little piece of white velvet in her that's never been touched. And I felt like, and that's a big deal for us girls and us Catholic girls. I got that from that inventory, and, and uh, set many years ago, she gave me a little piece of white velvet in a frame, and I have that next to my bed, and 
when I um, so I started to get more comfortable around you, and then I got a plan. And plans are great and perfectly appropriate. As long, and this is not theory, by the way. This is this is what happened to me. Um, this is experiential. That's all we've got here. If if you're new, by the way. Um, but you know, you got to keep A first. And and the old, I decided I wanted to move to Los Angeles. And the old timer said in Honolulu said that's great. But it's a really big fellowship there, and we would suggest that you get some regular meetings and get a home group and get connected right away because you could really fall through the cracks. And, of course, I really had no context. I didn't really know. You know, I just kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't, you know, I don't remember willfully saying, well, I'm not going to do that, but I didn't do it. I know that. And I got to Los Angeles, and it was exactly what they said. I mean, there's 4,000 meetings a week in the greater L.A. area. It is a huge, you know, it's a huge fellowship. and um and um, I think wherever you get sober, that that's A for you, right? And uh, I forgot that I was supposed to listen for the similarities and not the differences. And I got to the meetings, and they were a little bit different, and that's what I'm noticing. And this unfortunate thing about that is, is that when I'm looking for the differences, that's all I can see. And that space between me and you is getting bigger and bigger. And that distance between me and that door is getting smaller and smaller. And And I can't see it happening. You know, I don't, I don't know that's happening. I'm just, you know, I'm a little more, I'm getting more uncomfortable. And, and, and then, you know, I'm coming to meetings and I forgot too that I was supposed to see what I could give at that meeting. Not, you know, and you're, you're not friendly and it's, you know, it's all starting to shift, right? I, my, my perception of it all and, and just kind of make a long story short. And I hate this part of my story, but, but it's, uh, this, and this is why I don't mess with it too much today. And I, but I, I was sponsorless for about a year and a half, and I was just going to meetings when the heat was on. And, and you could, it doesn't happen to me anymore because I, I've been to so many meetings. So you always know somebody. And, but, you know, I'd go to just a, a meeting here. To me. I'd never go consistently enough for anybody to, to get to know me. And, and um, I looked up, and I'd been in Los Angeles about a year and a half, and I was coming up on my fifth day birthday, and you kind of take stock of those birthdays. And, um, you know, took a look at my life, and I had um, hooked up with some old friends back in my hometown in Santa Cruz, my friend Pam that I mentioned, for example. And through her, I met a heroin dealer in a park, and I was helping him spend his money and receiving stolen property from him a couple times and occasionally taking his collect calls from the county jail. And, and I knew that I was in a lot of trouble. Sober. I'm doing this sober. And I was in big, big trouble. And it was another, you know, another real surrender for me. And I was... It's funny, when I was back in Honolulu, there had been <clears throat> this woman who had a longtime sober member of Los Angeles, Mary Ann, class of six, 1969, and but she had been opening a restaurant in Honolulu, and she had been doing her job in AA. I was still out drinking, but she knew that wherever, she used to go and open different restaurants around the country for this chain, and um, that, you know, that she would always go to meetings when wherever she was and put her hand out and let people get to know her and be consistent at, at those meetings that, you know, she didn't take a vacation from AA because she was away from her home group. And, and so when I got sober and I was moving to Los Angeles, the old timer said, and you should, you should find this woman, Mary Ann. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. There's 9 million people in the city of Los Angeles and 4,000 AA meetings. I'm, I'll find Mary Ann. Thanks. That's very helpful. Um, and, <laughs> Um, I was I was starting a new job in L.A. I'd been there uh, a, about a year or so, and I started a new job, and I was nervous about it. I think, well, I'll, I should go to a meeting. It had been a long time. And I went to a meeting, and this woman started chatting with me, and I said, well, I'm you know, a little nervous starting a job tomorrow. And she said, where? And I told her, and she said, oh, I'll probably be training you. My name is Mary Ann. And um, <laughs> she... Uh, I knew she was an active member of an active home group, and you know, but I was terrified of her and you know again what you know what are you going to want from me and you know I have burned my life to the ground in sobriety and I'm thinking you want something from me and but when it got bad enough I kind of turned myself into her and I you know and I told her what I was doing and, and what things were, were looking like and, and the secrets that I was carrying and and I'm so you know and she didn't say you know you're a disgrace to AA and you must do these 47 things that came later when I got a sponsor but she just said uh, she said you know there's a little meeting I go to on Monday nights why don't you come and I am so glad that when Monday night came around I didn't have a better idea that one more time I'd been beaten into a state of reasonableness and I was willing to try it somebody else's way because when you're in that condition and somebody says go to a meeting you're thinking a meeting that is so lame I have deep-seated psychological problems that need to balance it. Like, 
what is sitting in a room with people that sh- you know that share my that share my problem going to do for me? You know, the people that are not, as Bill said, you know, we're not brothers in our so much in our virtues as brothers in our defects. You know, how is that going to help? The boy does it, and don't and don't we know it? And, but I, you know, I sat down next to her at the Monday night Ohio Avenue meeting, and I've been sitting next to her just about every Monday night ever since, and you know, well over, oh, I guess you know, twenty. Whatever, 23, 24 years ago, and she said, "Why don't you start looking around for a sponsor in our group?" And I was in no position to interview or anything like that. Um, <laughs> somebody just said, "Ask her," and I asked this woman, Karen, to sponsor me. And many of you may know Karen Garrison, and um, and I I told her what my life was looking like, and and you know, and the first thing she said was, um, "Honey, I expect a lot from the people I sponsor." And again, I'm glad, you know, I'm glad that that she said that. I'm glad that she that she had an expectation for me and, and held me to it. And um, she said, with your amount of sobriety, I I want you to, um, I think she said, go to four or five meetings a week and get commitments at those meetings, and I want you to answer phones at central office and get a, get a hospital institution panel and get involved with the other women I sponsor and call me um, every day, and um, I want you to, we're going to go through the steps again and do another inventory. And, and I thought, well, I've obviously picked the wrong sponsor because <laughs> her answers had nothing to do with my solutions at all, of course, you know, I mean, or with my problems. And, of course, I, I couldn't really tell you what the problems are. I can tell you what the solutions are. And she knew that that stuff was going to get me in the middle of the room. I have seen A from the fringes, and I've seen it from the middle, and the views are entirely different. When I'm on the outside looking in, it's a whole different thing. And my experience has borne out as well that my life works when I'm in the middle of you, period. It works when I'm in the middle of you. And and um, and and she knew that that stuff was going to put a foundation under me and a fellowship around me and put a lot of bodies between me and that door. And she knew that taking me through the steps again and, and that, you know, that there was stuff that I needed to clean up, that I wreckage in sobriety and things that needed to be cleaned up and, and, and things in, in that second inventory and other inventories that I've done since. that I can't, I, you know, there's things that I could never have seen. Um, when I had eight months or nine months sober, and that second inventory I did, one of the things that came out on that was I was, uh, you know, really ashamed of the fact that that I only had an eighth grade education, and and I'm still waiting tables, and I felt really stuck. But at the same time, in Los Angeles, I'm in speaker meetings, a lot of them, and you're hearing people like my friend Flint that I mentioned earlier. You know, I was living in a garage, and I'm a lawyer. I'm like that is amazing. If I sit in enough of these meetings, I'm gonna wake up and be a lawyer too one day. <laughs> But, of course, you know, in the 40-minute pitch, you're just getting the cliff notes, right? You're not getting all the trudging. And, and the, you know, the highs and lows, I think we can do pretty good, but the trudging is hard. You know, it is, I'll tell you, I, you know, I really like my life, but when my alarm clock goes off in the morning, I don't fall to my knees and say, oh, joy, it's another day walking hand in hand with my crater with new opportunities for growth. That's not, I usually say, damn it. And then I think, what can I call in sick for? When is my next nap? And and that just reminds me of, you know, why I need to be here with you and why I have regular meetings on regular meeting nights and why I keep commitments at those meetings. Because, you know, it's never a good idea for me to get to a meeting until I'm here. Whatever good I hear the night before, it seems to leak out of my head. You know, and the book is clear about that. On awakening, we think about, you know, the 24 hours ahead. Before we begin, we ask God to direct our thinking. I need my thinking directed first thing in the morning. Um, and I need to keep coming here to, to get what I get from you. Because my, you know, I'm like negative three meetings away from just going to bed forever. And so I just have to keep moving my feet. And, you know, and there are a lot of times I think, like, I teach public middle school in Los Angeles. I need to stay home tonight and make amends to myself. My God, you know, that if, if I have to pass that basket or light those candles or it's, you know, it's going to, it's going to keep my feet moving and, and, you know, bring the body and the mind will follow. And, but anyway, so I, you know, that inventory and I'm, you know, I felt so stuck as a waitress and, and, and didn't, uh, you know, and, and just kind of, I wanted just the pixie dust that's here and there is no pixie dust. Is there magic? Absolutely. But it's not, you know, it's not poof. It's, and Karen said, Penny, God only does for us what we can't do for ourselves. Why don't you get your high school high school diploma, take the GED exam? And I thought, that is so lame. <laughs> One, I know I can't pass. And two, like, what is that going to do? I mean, really, GED? How about a PhD, right? I'm never, I don't. <laughs> and, but I learned a big lesson there. Um, I, I just, you know, but uh, again, I've been, you know, beaten into a state of reasonableness. I'm always grateful for those surrenders that come. 
out of sobriety and in, in sobriety, just being willing to try it someone else's way. And, you know, one of the, the important, real important things I learned there was that it, it didn't, the action doesn't care how contemptuous you are, but it just matters that you take it. That's all that mattered. I thought it was stupid and lame and had no bearing on my case. And I didn't even know that it mattered until I had the letter in my hand from the state of California that said congratulations and became a high school graduate at 28. I had written that off as wreckage of the past because it's easier for me to smear at something and be contemptuous of it than to let you know that that's something that, that is that I'm sorrowful about and that I'm ashamed of. And that's also why I have a sponsor and sponsors that I'm current with, because I have this much objectivity about my own situation. I ha there has to be someone that has some distance and that wants the best for me. And, and I um, started going to community college, taking you know my sponsor's suggestion and taking a class at a time. And it wasn't the first community college I've been to. It was the third. I don't know about you. I'm a pretty good starter, not much of a finisher, right? <laughs> and I had all these reasons that, well, I can't go to school. I don't know anything. And, of course, I've since learned that's exactly what they're designed for. You don't, <laughs> you don't have to know anything. Just just go there. And, and how am I going to work and go to meetings and go to school and all that? You know, I now get all the school people. Sponsors send them to me, and it's always the same thing. How am I going to do it? How am I? And I said the same thing to my sponsor, and she said something really profound. She said, honey, just take the next indicated action. Well, that I could do. I didn't have to know what it was all going to look like. I could just take the next indicated action and take a class. And I started doing that. And, of course, I started this time going to school the way that you taught me to go to meetings, right? You get there on time or early. You stay through the whole thing, and you ask questions, and, and you show up. You show up no matter what. And I showed up on the days I was too dumb and the days I was too smart, and every day in between, which is probably like one day. And even days when I, you know, when I just thought this isn't going to work, I just, I just, you know, I got that, that conditioning from you. And, and, um, at the, I was there for about three years and, and eventually I got a couple little jobs on campus and I was a, you know, no, they weren't big deals, like $6 an hour filing and tutoring, but I was then, I guess, um, I don't know, eight, eight or nine years sober and, and, uh, you know, 29 years old. And they were my first jobs above minimum wage and outside of the restaurant business. And I just wanted to wake up one day and not be a waitress, right? The thought of working my way out of it was kind of unappealing, but I'm not special. I have to do what everybody else does. And a day at a time, I started to move away from that. And, and eventually a plan developed. I wanted to go to UCLA and, um, but I couldn't meet their math requirement and I ended up there an extra year and a half. I took computational skills three times, and, or computational skills twice, I guess, and introduction to algebra three times. And you taught me about footwork. I did all kinds of footwork, tutors and math anxiety tapes and video lecture, and they really have those. And um, <laughs> I, I was actually tutoring someone else in English, and, and he told me about this Office of Student Disabilities. And so I went and had myself tested for a learning disability, and I was told I had a severe learning disability in math and that I was not going to have a university education, that maybe I should consider a vocational school or a non-accredited school. Um, my sponsor, on the other hand, said, honey, just keep knocking on doors and just keep trying. And, you know, I, as someone who works in education today, what I know now is that one no means very little. It just meant somebody was misinformed. No big deal. But I want to take that no and use it to burn my life to the ground and prove you wrong for some perverse reason, right? And that's why I have a sponsor. And, um, I, I so I uh, I did that and I, I applied to, to UCLA um, and in June of '97 I got to put on a cap and gown for the first time in my life. I was 33 and 11 years sober, and um, and I I graduated from there and I got to give the commencement address at that graduation. And probably the best part of that was that my mom got to be there and sit in the VIP section. She had her scholar back. That was a long wait from eighth grade to 33, but but she took it and. And there was another member of my home group that also graduated that day, Keith, uh, Keith P. And, and we had a party at the Ohio Avenue meeting hall beforehand. And then we all, two or three hundred of our closest friends, you know, um, trumped up to campus. And I got to go to this VIP reception beforehand. And the other speaker was, he was um, an ambassador to the Middle East, one of Clinton's ambassadors. And, you know, there's all these other, and they do this academic roving ceremony. And they're, you know, um, dressing the the people in their, in their regalia from, you know, Princeton and their different universities and stuff. And then here I come with, you know, myself and my sponsor, a woman who, uh, my sponsor at the time, Karen, is a woman who came out of a blackout walking naked down the highway in, in Nebraska in February. And, uh, you know, if, they, if they only knew. And, 
Um, I put a lot of expectations on that degree, not really realizing I was doing it. Um, when you're in school, you know, people start saying, what are you, you going to do when you're finished? And I just start saying, I'm going to teach for a year and go to graduate school. But honestly, I never thought that I'd finish. I had been in and out of school for the first 11 years of my sobriety, and I just, just, just seemed to go on and on. I, I, I never thought that I would, that I would finish, and uh, I finished. And I thought, oh my God, I have to teach for a year and go to graduate school. And I, I was really scared. I got stuck again. And I, you know, I thought kind of like that first inventory. Once I get this degree, I'll never have another negative human emotion, and there'll be Ben her music, and it'll all be wonderful. No, I was just me with a degree. And there's nothing that I'm going to get out there that I don't need from you in here. And there's always work for me to do in here. There's always always more that, that needs doing. And, and I um, I kind of really floundered for a while. And I was praying and saying the third step prayer and the seventh step prayer. And, you know, God, where should I serve? What would you have me do? And a friend of mine in the program, my friend Lisa, kept saying, you know, we really need teachers, especially in middle school in Gardena, L.A. Unified. You know, will you come and take the job? I was like, no, no special ed. No middle school. You remember that age, the eye-rolling, chicken-necking age? No. Um, no LA Unified. I read the paper. 950,000 students. They're short 45,000 seats. 70% of them, you know, are below grade level. N none of the above. And where's Gardena? Like, none of, you know. And, uh, God, where should I serve? What would you have me do? Just show me where I come. And, yeah, you, you got it a lot faster than I did. Because I, I did not know that God did such a good impression on my friend Lisa. And, and I just, you know, that was the wrong thing. That was absolutely the wrong thing. And, and she was on me for months. And I was just really, and I easily, I mean, they, they would take, at that time, there was such a cheap teacher shortage, they would have just, I could have gotten a job anywhere. Oh, you have a pulse, you're hired, you know, on, on an emergency permit. And, and But I just, it was that fear. I was just paralyzed. And then, you know, one day I mentioned that job to my sponsor, who at that time was uh, Marion W. And I, I said, well, you know, it's very contemptuous. And well, there's this one job I can get, especially at middle school, for LA Unified. Nobody wants those jobs, which is absolutely true. And that's why I can get the job. And I felt the old sponsor pause on the line. I thought... I'm going to Gardena. <laughs> and, and she said, you know, as the mother of a former special ed student, I think you could really be of service there, and I think you know in your heart that that's where you're supposed to be. And the minute she said that, I did know in my heart that that's where I was supposed to be. But see, here's the deal. When I'm praying for the fear to be removed, what I mean is make me not afraid. I didn't mean send me to 162nd Normandy to make me walk through the fear. I know Wayne knows that <laughs> He, Wayne went to a neighboring middle school, um, and, uh, you know, that, that's like not what I meant at all, but, but, but that's what I got. And, and, and I just, and I thought, this is, can't she see this is absolutely the wrong thing? I mean, these sponsors make these suggestions, and you just think, that, it, that, that just can't be it. That's, you know, but having had that experience with the GED exam, you learn to see things, you know, well, maybe there's a different way to, to look at it. And I, I took that job, and it, you know, and it was, a. Uh, it was definitely a challenge. It was um, I um, I didn't start till February, and that uh, California ranks their schools on a scale of one to ten, ten being the highest. It was a two. We had a lot of problems, no doubt about that. Um, the class I took over, they had had day-to-day -day subs all year long. We had 17 unfilled positions that year at that school. You could not get people to you know to take those to take those jobs and. And, um, you know, but you taught me how to, how to show up and all the kids that I worked with, all kids in the system, mostly, you know, the foster family below the foster family level and in the group homes. And, but, um, you know, I was able to, to get through that year and, 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 you know, and it would, and it felt pretty good. It definitely felt pretty good, but I still had my plan. And so that next year I went up to Stanford and, uh, got a master's in English lit because I wanted to, thought that I wanted to teach at the community college level and, and um, so I did that, and, and when I came back, I, I ended up um, teaching at Pasadena City College where my learned disability is diagnosed and where my sponsor had sent me to take the next indicated action. I, I got a part-time job teaching there, but I found that my heart was really at 162nd Normandy Teaching Special in Middle School. And, and I'm, a, I'm a middle school teacher today, nothing fancy, you know. Um, I teach a little closer to home now. Um, you know, n nothing fancy at all, and I make a lot of mistakes. I, I really do, and, and I, you know, it's it's always kind of a challenge for me balancing my AA life and my teaching life and, and keeping my mouth shut. But I have to tell you that um, 
at least once a day and sometimes even more. I don't want to be anywhere else and I don't want to be anyone else. I feel purposely and usefully whole. And, you know, for the chronically restless, irritable, and discontent, that is not a bad deal. Um, about my 20th year of sobriety, it occurred to me that those pregnancies that I terminated, I thought I, I could never make right. And through the immense process, I was able to, you know, do some things through my faith and and, and the process of the steps to, you know, to, to, to get some, obviously, to live without drinking with that. But it always, there always felt like there was some unfinished business there. Year after year, there would be different things I would try and do, and always a little bit of unfinished business. And, you know, the gift of my 20th year was that I, it, you know, I, I got free of that. And it, it occurred to me that, um, you know, working with those unwanted kids that I worked with, it was a little way, way for me to balance those scales in a totally unexpected way. And, man, I could have missed that. If I would have put conditions on, if I would have said to Marion, you know, okay, I'll teach, but not special ed, not middle school, not there. You know, I was sure that God's will was less of a commute, that there would be soap and paper towels in the bathroom, and I wouldn't have some big kid in my face saying, oh, pimps left you be. Like, that is, that cannot be it, you know. Um, but it turns out, you know, that, that that was the unexpected gift that I, you know, it didn't look like it was it was it was going to be a gift, and, and I got a new level of freedom there. And I remember asking Marion, you know, later, like, how did you know? How did you know that that was the right thing? And she said, I didn't know, which is always comfortable. Right? <laughs> she said, I didn't know. I just knew I didn't mean you any harm. And I think that when I'm surrendered and someone else is willing to serve, that God can come in in that place in the middle, you know. Um, and I'm glad I didn't get in God's spot for that one. I've probably gotten in it a lot of other times. But that one, um, I got in it, and, and it was a great gift. It's given me a, a great freedom. Um, my life is good. It is all your fault. And um, I just, uh, there's a quote that I love. It's in the book, and I kind of rewritten it as, as Bill sees it. And that is that outsiders are sometimes shocked when we, when we burst into merriment over a seemingly tragic event out of the past. But we have recovered and are helping others to recover. And what greater cause can there be for rejoicing than this? Thank you so much for my life. Thanks for being so present with me tonight. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.